We're now coming to Geraint Powell, who is going to talk to us about sustainable grazing strategies that meet ecological demands. This is an AHDB beef and lamb sponsored study. Garand is a self-employed livestock and fencing contractor who looks after the sheep and cattle for a farming company based near Sarancester. Originally from the Brecon Beacons, Garand has lived and worked on the Cotswolds for the last 20 years. Working in a business that claims no support payment, Garand is a strong believer that environmental awareness and productivity can happen and has to happen in the same place. Garrett is looking forward to the opportunities that await the red meat industry in the future. Garrett. Good morning, everyone. This is the technology I work with. It's a mobile, solar-powered bioreactor that landscapes, composts, and recycles biology while consuming inedible cellulose and converting it into mineral-rich, nutrient-dense, edible proteins. If programmed correctly, this technology can build soils, improve biodiversity, and draw carbon down out of the atmosphere. It is also known as a sheep. This is my office, the Cotswold area of outstanding natural beauty, and very pretty it is too. But I have to say that there is nothing natural about this scene. This is a farmscape. It's a man-made construct developed over thousands of years of food production and recreation. And even today, it is still evolving and changing. And no matter how hard you try or, or how well-intentioned your efforts are, you will never keep any landscape in an arrested state. So, what was the issue? Why do enough field scholarship? Well, we are governed by the volatility of commodity prices. Costs are escalating. Productivity is stalling. And we are chasing numbers even harder to at best break even, with only very few livestock businesses making profit without support payments factored in. What is the reason for this precarious position? Is it the inevitable race to the bottom of commodity prices in pursuit of cheap food policies? Or are we trying to outperform the natural metrics of production that our land and soil can deliver? For me as well, it was a personal journey of what is my future in livestock farming going to be? What is going to be the next challenge? And what direction will that take? So the big question became, how do we balance the economy, which is the business model, and the economy, and the ecology, sorry, which is the environment? Or put in another way, how do we make best use of nature's goods and services without having a negative effect on these resources while still maintaining levels of productivity and profitability? And as at this point, I would like to thank my sponsors, AHDB Beef and Lamb for their kind generosity, and the Nuffield farming team for their much needed support over the last two years. The regenerative agricultural movement was making the right noises and seemed to make a lot of sense to me. Regenerative agriculture is a system of farming that enriches soils, improves biodiversity, and enhances watersheds and ecosystem services. So I traveled from the Dakotas to Droitwich, meeting farmers who had taken a different approach to their crop and livestock production. True innovation is conceived in the fringes. And in many cases, this is a system of farming that has been created by the most powerful disruptor a business can face, which is impending bankruptcy. When you have no money to buy inputs, you find another way or you lose your farm. These farmers made some very, very bold decisions. And over time, these decisions has resulted in them questioning science, tradition, and the certainty of modern advice. So these farmers 
They began to mimic nature to produce an optimum, and they became profit, not yield orientated, never outperforming their environment, and always testing their decision making against the context of their future natural resource base. Soil health and diversity was their main focus. Over many years of observing and monitoring, these farmers had become the masters of recruiting biological processes and harvesting sunlight to fuel them. Their animals were healthy and profitable, and their bank accounts were the envy of their neighbors who obviously dismissed their unconventional methods of farming. I met a lot of innovative thinkers as I traveled, and there was a common theme amongst all of them. They were all profitable, creative, and self-confessed lunatics. But the one thing that they all had in common, and they all stressed to me, that the resilience and success they'd built in the livestock systems was only made possible by educating themselves on the complex relationship between the sun, the soil, the plant, and the animal. This became a turning point in my thinking of my Nuffield study. I thought I had it all planned out. You go out in the world, you find, the, find out the what, and then you work out the how, you come home, put it into practice, job done. No, because I was missing one thing. I was missing the why. The why is the understanding of what you do. What value do you offer to others beyond the money you make and the things you sell? I realized that I'd spent most of my career being propelled by hydrocarbons from farm to farm, reacting to the effects of symptoms. I needed to slow down and start addressing causes and stop reaching for the shelf because this is a shelf that is becoming too expensive and less effective. It was at that point that I realized that my Nuffield study was going to be not about fit, uh, crossing the finish line, instead it would be about finding the start. Because I realized there was no point in me studying grazing systems if I had no idea what the impact these grazing systems would have on the ecological processes around me beyond the interaction of the plant and the animal. So on taking the advice on some of the very inspirational people I'd met, I set about to learn the language of the land and the processes of the governor. And the place you start is soil health and diversity. So soil health. We all owe our existence to the thin layer of weathered material on the surface of the earth and the fact that it rains. I attended a soil food web course to learn more about the, the complex interactions of soil, um, soil organisms. And what I learned on that course is that plant size, leaf area, root mass, and how much grass you leave behind are all incredibly important factors when formulating a grazing system that allows your soil to function properly. Or in other words, the health and abundance of your below ground livestock will be a direct reflection of the health and profitability of your above ground livestock. To learn more about diversity, I traveled to East Germany. The Gina experiment is the longest running biodiversity experiment in Europe. The purpose of the experiment is to study the above and the below ground synergies and measure bio biodiversity effect on ecosystem function and plant growth. And the day I turned up on the most diverse pasture in Europe, it looked like this. <laughs> but I did go. I did go. When considering the benefits of diversity on soil health, plant growth, animal health, and animal performance, why in recent years have we become obsessed with monoculture, artificial inputs, and bowling green grass? I believe we need to start looking and working with something different. We have picked and chosen at our peril out of the natural model of production, and now it is time to start putting it back. I attended a three-day grazing school run by the South Dakota Grazing Co Coalition, and it was, it was fantastic to be surrounded by all that knowledge for three days. And I also learned that a semi-automatic shotgun is the coolest raffle prize I have ever seen. <laughs> so what, what did I learn on the course? 
Keep your solar panel big to feed all microbes. Plan, keep planning, and plan again. Rest is the most powerful tool we have as grazers in our climate. Be the predator. Complete the ecosystem. And as we've heard before, wasted grass, trampled grass is not wasted grass. It feeds soil biology and protects the soil. The conversations over these, those three days further expanded my thinking on our decline in financial performance and our stalling productivity. The consensus amongst these ranchers was very clear in that you cannot create the environment for your animal. Your animal has to be part of the environment. If the ecosystem doesn't function correctly, then neither can your animal within it. We're encouraged by the tutors to treat the farm or the ranch as an ecosystem, and our job was to manage that ecosystem to function correctly. Why? This is nature's engine. We don't produce anything. This does. We just facilitate it. And if you fight that, you will lose. And I believe this is where we're going wrong with prescriptive policy. And I see a lot of this managing grazing for our landowners. We have become too focused on single outcome approach, whether it be for the animal, the bird, the plant, or the invertebrate that we are protecting or manipulating the environment for. The start point is to take a systems approach to ecosystem function, and we'll, with that will come, we'll come the benefits of landscape scale results. Because as you heard in the introduction, I believe that environmental awareness and productivity has to and can happen in the same place. So my recommendations, embracing the benefits of soil health and diversity will result in greater resilience. The what is completely ineffective if the why is not understood. Allocate your resources to ensure growth is regenerative. Your business should create wealth, not consume it. The most profitable place to keep a cow is where nature thrives. For most of us, commodities are a cruel mistress, and the supermarket till has become the most powerful voting system we have ever seen. I found no silver bullet because there is no silver bullet but I did find a direction. The success stories I met while traveling were not addicted to the activity of farming. Instead, they were driven by an understanding that the ecological, economical, and social responsibilities of agriculture cannot be separated or treated in isolation. We are going to experience some bumps in the road, but we can all take comfort in the fact that we live in a climate where the sun will shine, a little bit. It will rain a lot and plants will grow very well. So I encourage you all to be creative, be brave, and understand your why. Thank you very much for listening.